How's it going, guys? It's your boy, Diego. Once again, going to be talking about the UFC. This time, we're going to be talking about the fight fallout from this past weekend's you know, UFC fight night. I can't remember what number it was, but it was headlined by Paige Van Zandt and Michelle Watterson. And there's so many of these events that a lot of times these sort of slip by. Like, for example, I didn't realize that there were fights until, like, Thursday. And I'm pretty I'm pretty balls deep in this stuff. I pay a lot of attention to, to MMA stuff and a lot, mostly UFC. So, for me to completely miss the cracks on this one until basically Thursday and not have enough time to do a prediction video is kind of bad for the UFC because, like, you know, sure, main media, or at least their their main people are going to be knowing about it, but a lot of times what helps the UFC are the smaller outlets, including somebody like me who is obviously very small but building. So, they need to be working on that and make a lot, I think I'd say, a lot less events. And if they are going to have this many small events, they need to at least do some marketing for them. Because I really didn't see much about it. Now, let's go ahead and start off with Paige Van Zandt. The Dancing with the Stars, was, was she a winner, runner-up? I can't remember what she was, doesn't really matter. Uh, got her ass beat by Michelle Watterson, and I'm not really surprised by that. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the the, the women's fights, because I think they're, they're pretty rudimentary compared to the men. Apart from, like, Ju uh, Joanna, Jen Jacek, and people like that. Those are, I love those fights, but... Like, Paige Van Zandt, as popular as she is and as highly pushed by the UFC as she is because of her looks, she's just not that She's just not that good, to be completely honest with you. She is not anywhere near as good as the UFC wants you to believe she is. Uh, and she's 7-3, and three, which isn't a very good record. But she's just, she's what, 22? She's my age. She's 22. She's only got, like, 10 professional fights. And she's already fighting against some of the best women in the world, even though, apart from, I would say, the top four, top five, there's really not that many high-level strawweight fighters. They're still pretty experienced from Invicta and stuff like that. So she's taking on people that have way more experience than her. And although she has a lot of talent, she's just not ready for these type of, pe these type of people. And the Karate Hottie is a very good fighter. She trains with Greg Jackson and Albuquerque, so she's got a great striking coach. Her wrestling is going to be very, very good, and just like you saw, her submissions are very slick too. So it was just, it was a bad matchup for Paige Van Zandt. The UFC is giving her too much too soon, and I think that a great fight for her next would be somebody like Joanna, uh, Joanne Calderwood, excuse me. I think that Joanne Calderwood is a very high-experienced fighter, but she's a very similar fighter to Paige Van Zandt in the sense that she goes balls to the wall, and she likes to put a lot on the line, and she does get caught a lot. So that's the type of fight that Paige Van Zandt could use to her advantage. I think that Paige would probably be able to be a far superior athlete than, than Joanna is, than Joanne, not Joanna. Uh, and I think that she would probably get the win um, because of the fact that her wrestling is also a factor, and Joanne does not have any wrestling. From what I've seen, she doesn't have any wrestling at all. So I think that overall it would just be a very favorable ma favorable matchup for Paige Van Zandt, and that's something the UFC is going to be looking at because they want PVZ to win as much as possible and be as big a name as possible. Now let's go ahead and talk about the winner of that fight, and honestly probably one of the top five women in that division, even though she was only ranked 11th before the fighting Paige Van Zandt. Uh, Michelle Watterson. What I think that's great about Michelle Watterson, like I said, is the fact that she's very well-rounded. Now, she's the karate hottie, so obviously her base is karate. So her striking is very good. We saw in that fight she's got some good kicks. She's got a lot of side kicks. She's just got a lot of unorthodox stuff, which is very good considering the rest of the women in her division are pretty basic Muay Thai, not counting Joanna and Carolina, but, you know, for the most part, they are pretty basic when it comes to their striking. And other than that, I think that She's probably the top striker behind Joanna uh, and maybe even behind Carolina. It depends on what exactly. You have to put put her against one of those two to be able to find out what really goes on. But I think that Michelle Watterson is definitely one of those chicks that could be competing with the best. And I would like to see her take on Rose Namajunas, who in her own right is a pretty dangerous striker. She's got good hands. She's got really good unorthodox submissions. So she will be able to test somebody like Michelle Watterson, who, like I said before, has great striking, has very solid wrestling, and has a pretty solid submission game as well. So I think it'd be a pretty competitive battle between two of the rising women in that division. And Michelle Watterson is like 30 years old, so she's not exactly young, but she has a lot to do in this game. And I think that she could be one of those fighters that could compete with Joanna, at least compete with her. I don't think she'll beat Joanna, but I think she could definitely compete with her better than most of these other women in this division. So I would like to see her take on somebody who's in the, uh, the upper echelon of that division. And Rose Nama Yunus is definitely one of the top chicks in that division. Now I want to talk about Mickey Gall, and if you're a Punch Drunk fan, maybe that's how you found me or something like that. I write a lot for a sports website called Punch Drunk Sports, so check that out. That would be in the description, and check out Punch Drunk. The podcast is hilarious. And Mickey Gall is 
a regular caller on the podcast for Punch Drunk Sports. He's a hilarious guy, and he went out there and he put on a very solid performance against Sage Northcutt. Now, I love Mickey Gall. I've I've grown to like him a lot over his you know involvement in the podcast and his personality and stuff like that. We've seen a lot of him since since he fought C, uh, CM Punk, and we got to see a lot of his personality there. We got to see what he's really about. And this Sage Northcutt fight, I think, showed that he does have the dark side to him that we needed him to be able to show because we saw that Sage Northcutt was always going to be the good guy. He doesn't really go out of his out of his um, comfort zone when it comes to talking and stuff like that. So he was never going to be the bad guy. It was always going to be up to Mickey Gall to really bring out the publicity for this fight and call out um, Sage Northcutt. And that's what he did. And I think, apart from his ground game, his striking is, is definitely very rudimentary. He needs to work on that big time because Sage Northcutt, who has a lot of experience with classical martial arts and is a very good striker, has a lot of good techniques, and he's very solid as a striker, but as we saw, his ground game is pretty piss poor. Mickey Gall got tagged up a few times in there. When Basically, when Sage Northcutt was on his feet, he was tacking up uh, Mickey Gall. And uh, honestly, I think Mickey Gall kind of got lucky with the punch they landed to knock down uh, Sage Northcutt. That was a relatively lucky shot just because he sort of winged it over after getting hit. And he never really looked like he was in really in control of that punch. So as good as it was, the fact that he landed and all that stuff, there's no doubt that he needs to work on his striking big time. And I think that the fact that he called out Dan Hardy is a good thing because we know that Dan Hardy wants to get back in the cage. But Dan Hardy is one of the best fighters in the welterweight division, or at least he was. You know, this guy, this is a guy that challenged George St. Pierre for the title. We're talking about one of those best fighters in the world at one point. And I'm not too sure if Mickey Gall really wants to go down that route and fight somebody as good as Dan Hardy right now. Because, listen, all right, he wants he wants to move on to lightweight and all that stuff, but he and he wants to test himself against some big-name fighters and really get himself in the talks for a title, at least in the title contention, to be in the top 15, top 10. But Dan Hardy is a very, very tough matchup for him. He's just very, he's a very complete fighter, and he's very, very good. So I don't think that Mickey Gall should be fighting Dan Hardy, but at the same time, I want to see it happen because of the fact that he's pretty much done everything that he, he can do to possibly get himself around the top 15. I mean, he's beaten the UFC's golden boy. He beat, well, not the golden boy, but, you know, the guy behind Conor McGregor. He beat um, CM Punk. He beat Mike Jackson. He's destroyed them all. So, realistically, I mean, maybe he should just take that next jump and see what happens. Either you sink or swim. If he sinks... You know, it's a it's a lesson learned against a top fighter. You can get a lot better from that. And since he's only 24 years old, he's only going to be improving. And he's going to do it very fast if he can really find the right coaches. And apparently, he's found his striking coach. He's been going through a lot of different gyms over the past few years. And now he seems to have found, at least that's what he said, he found his real striking coach, the one that he really feels like he can work with well and really start developing his striking. So as we saw, he needs to do that. So I think that Dan Hardy is a big jump for him, but one that he could possibly do and one that we could possibly see in the future so stay tuned to see what happens between Mickey Gall and possibly Dan Hardy now I want to talk about Sage Northcutt and I mean much like Paige Van Zandt I think that they're just giving too much push to Sage Northcutt and I don't really understand why I mean I get it he's got the little goody two shoes attitude he's sort of trying to be the, perf the perfect guy even though his background is pretty shady his dad used to sell steroids or something like that and it's just a weird thing and if you see how physically built he is at 20 years old and even when he came into the UFC I think he was an 18 maybe already 19 but he was still like really 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 big and really cut and stuff like that and it could be because he's been doing martial arts all his life but it could also be because his dad who was a steroid seller possibly gave him some Mexican supplements and gave him sort of a, fig a physical advantage early on in his years. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case. He's never been caught, so I can't really say that. But I do think that Sage Northcutt needs to be taking on people that are a little bit lower level. And I just think that they're giving him too much too early because we've seen his striking is very good and it's very unorthodox, but his ground game is piss poor. And he needs to work on that. He needs to be able to use that before he can be fighting against some really tough guys. And Mickey Gall was always going to be a bad matchup for him because Mickey Gall's ground game is very good. He's a legit brown belt. And as we've seen, he can strangle some pretty decent guys. Uh, Sage Northcutt's a very decent fighter and he also held his own on his feet. Not really. But he did pretty decent against Sage, so that was a tough matchup for Sage. And I would like to see him fight somebody that's a little bit more striking-based. And since Sage Northcutt apparently wants to fight at welterweight now, or because that's what that's the fight he took place, that's what the fight he took at welterweight that was against Mickey Gall, then maybe he should fight somebody like Mike Perry. Now you're probably thinking, I mean, how the fuck is Sage Northcutt going to be able to stand up with Matt Perry, with Mike Perry, 
Matt Berry is from Friends. Uh, I mean, how's he going to stand up with him when he's not that not that heavy-handed himself? Well, I mean, I I definitely agree with that, and I do not think that Sage Northcutt should be fighting at welterweight. I would like to see him fight at lightweight, but since both guys lost on the same card and they lost a similar level of opposition, even though Alan Juban is a much more developed fighter and a much more, uh, I guess you could say, UFC experienced fighter, I don't think that he's necessarily a crazily good fighter. So I think that Mike Perry against Sage Northcutt would be an interesting fight to see because Sage's striking could probably match up pretty decently with Mike Perry's. But I would like to see Sage Northcutt at, stay at lightweight, and I don't really know who could fight at lightweight, to be honest with you. I don't really know what would be a good matchup for Sage at lightweight. So right now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave sort of a, a question mark alongside Sage Northcutt. But there's definitely a lot they could do with him. I just hope they don't give him too much too early like they have been doing right now and give him a little bit more time to develop his all-around game before he really takes too much damage to be able to continue to improve himself at the right, to the right degree, essentially. Now I want to talk about Alan Juban, who I sort of talked about when I was talking about Sage. What I think is good about Alan Juban is the fact that he's very well-rounded and he doesn't only have MMA to basically bank on. He's a model. I think he's a Versace model. I think I see him on TV all the time when they have Versace commercials and stuff like that. So he has what it takes to make money elsewhere, but he continues to fight and he continues to improve, which means he has a lot of passion for the sport. He's not just doing it because it's his only option. He's doing it because he really loves it. And the fact that he trains with Eddie Bravo is a big thing because a lot of times you have these guys that are like him, that are very lanky, lanky, and they have pretty good striking, but they sort of don't put a lot of pressure on the jiu-jitsu. And the fact that he's training at 10th Planet with Eddie Bravo is huge because Eddie Bravo is one of the best coaches out there and can really put him on the map as a jiu-jitsu practitioner in the UFC. And especially in the welterweight division, when you have guys like Damian Maya and Tyrone Woodley, you need to be on point with your jiu-jitsu and with your wrestling and stuff like that. And Eddie Bravo, 10th Planet, is a good place to be learning that. And I think that I was very impressed by the fact that he was very well rounded in that fight. Now, we've seen Ellen Juban fight a lot of tough guys and he's done he's pretty much always done very well, but in this fight in particular, I was very happy with the way he was using his range and he was pretty much keeping Mike Perry away from him the whole time and Mike Perry was sort of unable to do anything really and uh, he was always on the back foot and didn't really know much of what to do against Alan Juban. So I would like to see Alan Juban take a step up in competition and fight Jake Ellenberger. Jake Ellenberger, who was unlucky, sort of, I guess his foot got caught in the cage, something like that. It was weird, and he, he was sort of unlucky to get finished like that by, by Jorge Masvidal. But I would like to see Juban and Ellenberger go at it, because I think it'd be a very interesting matchup for Juban to take on somebody who is a very solid fighter and see if he can get himself among the top 15, or if he's just not quite good enough to be on there. Uh, otherwise, I would like to see if if Jake Ellenberger really does have it because he's very he's been very up and down and he needs to start getting on a run. If he could beat Alan Juban, then he could potentially get up some momentum and really start moving forward because he used to be one of the top guys in the welterweight division, but he's just gone back so far. It's hard for us to see him up as the top one of the top guys, and we need him. Or I don't really need him, but we need to see him do something big and beating Alan Juban would be a good step forward before we can really start consider considering him one of the best fighters in the world again. I already talked about Matt Perry. Uh, Matt Perry, once again, Mike Perry. So I'm not really going to go into, into that anymore. I think that Sage Northcutt would be a very interesting opponent for him just because of the, the fact that both guys are very interesting strikers. They're very fun to watch. I guess you could, well, Sage Northcutt, I have to give him credit, you know. As much as I think the UFC's sort of pushing him too much, he does put on some fun fights. So I would like to see him fight Mike Perry. But if Sage Northcutt decides to stay down at lightweight, then I would like to see Mike Perry fight somebody on the fringes of the top 15. I don't. I just don't think he's ready for the top 15. He's also very rudimentary. I think he's, what, 9-1? and one? And So he only has 10 fights. So... He needs to be taking his time a bit and really developing himself as a fighter. He's not he he can't just be a heavy-handed guy and really do well in the UFC. He has to have a lot more tools than he does. So that's something that he needs to work on. And I would like to see him, like I said, fight somebody on the fringes. I can't really think of anybody off the top of my head or doing any research that I really think make a lot of sense. So I'll just leave that to the matchmakers of the UFC and see what they can come up with. So now we're gonna talk about Brad Pickett, who got beat up by Uriah Faber, which is something I really expected to happen. And if you want to see what my take on Uriah Faber, then I would say 
click on the video as you'll see at the end of the video on the end screen where you'll see the link and it'll tell you to uh, follow watch my Uriah Faber tribute video because I go into detail about his career and how much of an impact he had on, on the UFC and in MMA in general so to just check that out I'm not going to talk about what's next in his career because obviously there is nothing next in his UFC career so check that out if you want to see more about Uriah Faber and Brad Pickett you know as I expected he got beat up pretty badly by Uriah who is just a much better fighter than Brad Pickett even though Pickett has a very dangerous left hook and he's got a big heavy hand he's still just not on the top the top game you know he's just not a top level fighter and it's a shame because he has the personality and he is an entertaining guy I just don't think that he can compete with the best guys honestly and Uriah Faber exposed that uh what I would like to see him do is fight somebody like Takeo Mizugaki who also lost pretty badly recently and I think it would be an interesting matchup because the winner of that could definitely be in the top 15, whereas the loser could probably just get out. I mean, honestly, these guys, these are both guys that have taken a lot of damage, and these are both guys that probably need to start considering getting out of the UFC, at least going into a smaller organization and just stop taking so much punishment and sort of being a punching bag for the rising stars. So Pickett versus Mizugaki is an interesting fight. And if you enjoyed the video, guys, please hit the like button and please subscribe and share it with any friends that you think might be interested. Let me know in the comment section down below who you think each of these fighters should take on and if there was one particular fighter that impressed you a lot in that card. And uh, guys, thanks for watching. I will see you in the next video.